All right. So I said, now we need to start with this, this picture of so our appendix. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm pleased to um, introduce you to Robert Talbert. He's been using a new technology, a web-based technology, in place of eye clickers in his class, and he's going to demonstrate how he's been doing that and share some expertise with you. So let's welcome Robert Talbert. Thanks a lot. And before I begin talking, let me just say that if you signed up uh, for to use Learning Catalytics uh, through the email that I sent out the other day, if you would, just at a moment when you're not surfing Facebook on your phones or on your iPads, uh, go to learningcatalytics.com and sign in and join session 167499. And if you do that successfully, it should say, wait for the question to be revealed or something to that effect. Yes, yes sir. Please, well, I, I managed to forget my password and my login. Do <laughs> you have the session code, sign it code, does someone have that? There, there. Oh, it's right oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a true demo of the class. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks for, thanks for uh, having me do this. Uh, I wanted to give this talk for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, a lot of us are using clickers in the classroom or thinking about using clickers in the classroom. And I feel like it's really important for us to share uh, what's happening, what we're doing in the classroom uh, with that particular technology. So I hope to do that today in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And uh, also, I received a grant from the uh, QFTLC to implement the software. And since I'm getting all this money, and since I'm messing around with one of like, the most important classes we offer in the curriculum here, and just totally you know, monkeying with this, I feel like I owe you an explanation as to where all this stuff, what's going on here. So uh, hopefully I'll do that too. So uh, here's the overview of the talk. We're going to talk about peer instruction, first of all, which is a pedagogical model that I'm using in Matthew 27, and a lot of my other courses too, that sort of uh, gives rise to the problem for which this technology is a solution, okay? Um, then we're going to talk about classroom response systems in general and clickers in particular. Uh, and the switch to this so-called bring your own device approach, which is what you're doing now, you're bringing your own devices. And uh, do a little demo of learning catalytics where you get to play around with the software with your own devices. And then finally, uh, I want to spend some time talking about how this is working in Math 227 currently. Uh, we're kind of obviously uh, a little past halfway point in the semester, has some data, some interesting uh, pedagogical situations to share with you and you can kind of role play with this. First of all, what is a peer instruction? PI stands for peer instruction. Peer instruction is an instructional technique that was uh, developed by Eric McCoy, a <coughs> physicist at Harvard University, for use in his uh, intro physics courses. He found that, uh, and stop me if this sounds familiar, but he found that his students, his physics students at Harvard, could make it all the way through uh, his class and pass beautifully through his final exam, calculating everything known to man, but had no idea what physics was, because if you gave them some questions about basic physics concepts, basically they were operating uh, on a level pretty much in, like a fifth century model of physics. Uh, so they could calculate their way through anything, but they really didn't know any physics, because the conceptual knowledge just simply wasn't there. And so he developed peer instruction as a way to bolster that, uh, to shift the focus of his classes to conceptual uh, understanding rather than uh, procedural understanding. A typical peer instruction session goes like this. Uh, a 50 minute course might be arranged around three to four main concepts, three to four essential ideas uh, that are developed in that particular class. There's usually some degree of flipping that goes on where uh, students have to do some reading and some activity outside of class. We come in, each concept is uh, presented briefly by the instructor, maybe a five minute mini lecture. And then students are given a conceptual question, a question that is targeted specifically at one of the fundamental misconceptions about that concept. Okay, which uh, put, again, put yourself in the shoes of teaching calculus this way. Okay? And you can think about, you know, break your classes down into concepts and what do students typically misunderstand about each of those concepts. So a question is thrown up on the uh, screen or given to the to students in some way uh, that doesn't involve a lot of calculations. This is a conceptually oriented question. Students uh, consider that question for about one minute, completely silently thinking to themselves. And then they uh, vote. This is a typically thought of as a multiple choice question that students have to respond to. And they vote using a classroom response system, some means of voting on a question. That could be as low tech as a colored note card. Uh, it could be as high tech as something I'm going to describe here. But in some way or another, they vote on this question. 
depending on the percentage of students that get a, the correct answer on this question, that determines what the instructor does next. Okay, if uh, fewer than thirty percent are getting this correct, these are just round numbers that are, are just general idea, general principles here. Fewer, if a, very few students get that correct answer on this, it's probably the instructor's fault. Probably there's something that needs to just be revisited in a different way. So we just loop back around, uh, revisit the concept, and then try it again. If uh, a middling number of students are getting that correct answer, then what happens next is that students are broken into pairs or threes, <coughs> ideally with someone that who, with whom they disagree on this question. Their task now is to argue in favor, in favor of their answer and against all the others. So a very rigorous, uh, vigorous debate takes place. So students argue in favor of their right answer and against all the wrong ones for a couple of minutes and then revote. Okay. If, uh, <coughs> and, what typically happens on the second round of voting is one of two things. Either we have more than 75% correct or it's exactly 50-50. Very close to exactly 50-50. So it's an interesting uh, it, it, organic uh, settling takes place there. Uh, if we have more than 75% correct on that first round of voting, pretty much you can, you can trust the students are more or less understanding this concept and move on to a debrief, uh, thinking of anything that's left over, and then we move on to the next topic. Yes, sir. So obviously, the, in the first case, you don't tell them what the correct answer is. That's right. Yeah. Like, even in the second case, you don't even show what the votes were. Okay. Yeah, that's it. It's been it's, some research has been done on this, and if you do a first round voting, and you don't want to say, well, 60% of you are voting for A, so let's do a revote, because then you know, oh, 60% I'm in the minority, I better, you know, you just say we don't have a strong consensus on this topic, so let's vote again. That's probably the best way to do it. So that's a typical peer instruction uh, uh, mode, and this might happen two or three, four times in a particular class meeting. So it's very uh, heavily driven by students uh, through discussion. Uh, no instructor intervention is taking place during the second round of voting, uh, just uh, answering clarification questions. Now, the key uh, bottleneck here is right there. Typically, the classroom response system is one of these guys, okay? one of these uh, clicker systems that I think we've all seen around here. A number of us have a box of these sitting in the drawer somewhere. I have a box. Um, that's a clicker, okay, uh, a typical turning point RF response card clicker, and uh, it is what you see, okay, it's a, it's a radio device, uh, pretty much the same as your garage door opener, it's the same technology as your garage door opener, you, you click a button on here, it releases a radio signal, there's a little USB device that sticks in your computer, and it receives the radio signals and tallies the data, okay, it's a very, very, very simple device. Let's talk about those clickers for a little bit. Well, first of all, here's a typical uh, peer instruction question. Okay, this was actually, I gave this in a Calc 2 class, but it was a, obviously a review of a Calc 1 uh, moving into an a, 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 a application problem here. So you can see there's not a lot of calculations that take place on there. There are no calculations that you could do on this. Okay? But you can see where you, you might not get full consensus on this kind of a question. Okay, some students may have a may think like you can't tell anything because there's no formula. For example, that's you, often when I give this question, that's the number one answer. Well, I don't know the formula, so I can't tell. You know, but in fact, you can tell information about this, and you know, students can engage and teach each other in this. That's why it's called peer instruction. Okay, so uh, five questions, multiple choice. Okay. Let's talk about the clickers. Oh, uh, no, I don't want to talk about that yet. <laughs> People always ask me, it's like, well, what evidence do you have that this is actually successful? There's actually about 20 years worth of uh, scholarship of teaching and learning that uh, weighs in in favor of peer instruction. Um, there was a gigantic epic study done uh, with 6,000 students across multiple universities and community colleges by Richard Pake uh, of Indiana University in uh, 1997. Uh, in physics courses, uh, using peer instruction, some not using standard lecture. And uh, he found that students in the peer instruction courses were showing uh, improvements on this uh, test called the force concept inventory. It's a standard conceptual inventory for physics, uh, showing gains of two standard deviations higher uh, than students in straight lecture courses. And this is a massive uh, sample. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a seminal study in this literature. Students are definitely across all genders, across all institutional types, showing massive gains, uh, significant gains over straight lecture courses. Uh, students in these peer instruction-based physics courses, uh, interestingly enough, to get these conceptual questions in, you have to take a lot of computation examples out, right? Because you can't create more time in the class session, so you do less computation. What Mazur found was that students improved on their computational skills with less direct instruction on computation <laughs> because they're focusing on conceptual ideas. Yeah, which is uh, counterintuitive until you think about it, I guess, right? If you have, uh, if you have a, a better uh, basis for your, uh, your uh, conceptual understanding, you're going you're to know what to do when you're put into a computational situation. 
Um, this also uh, bridges the uh, levels of playing field in a number of ways. Uh, this study here showed uh, that uh, in one particular course, uh, the gender gap between uh, performance on the force concept inventory and the lecture course was effectively eliminated uh, when you moved it to a peer instruction course. Um, and finally, uh, this uh, these, uh, pair here, this is a study done very recently, uh, gave students a pre and post test on the NESI, the National Survey of Student Engagement, some of the sub items from there, both before and after a peer instruction course and showed some significant gains in student engagement. They measured the student engagement using this particular survey. So all the vectors are pointing, uh, pardon the pun here, because I'm talking about linear algebra, all the vectors are pointing in favor of uh, peer instruction as a pretty handy and useful way to teach. But what about those clickers? Because <laughs> that's, uh, that's the technological bottleneck uh, between uh, between success and failure sometimes. You can use peer instruction, and people do all the time, with no technology whatsoever, just using colored note cards. Okay? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of high schools, for example, that don't have the funding to do this. There's a lot of pluses to these clickers. I mean, they're extremely simple, they're very robust, and you can practically run this thing over with an automobile, and it's still going to work. Okay? Uh, uh, I have not experimentally verified that, but I believe it's probably true. And despite what they look like, they're pretty low tech. I mean, basically, you click a button, it produces a radio signal, the radio signal is received. There's, it's very hard to screw up using clickers from the tech, from the tech support standpoint. Okay, well, let's get this set up right. But there are some downsides for this, too. They are expensive, and one of these little guys here will cost $40 new. Okay, uh, 20 ish dollars to use. I've seen them for as low as $8.99 on eBay. Uh, still, you know, when the student comes in, they have all this other stuff to buy, and they have to go buy a clicker. Okay? And that gets me to the second point. They're basically unitasking devices. This thing has is totally useless outside the context of a classroom. Okay? You can't, unless you can get in here and hack it to actually open your garage door, which I'm not saying you can't, but maybe not. Uh, it's pretty much you buy this for your class, and you're never going to use it again. Let's face it. And uh, they're pretty limited uh, pedagogically, too, because what sorts of questions can you answer with this? Multiple choice and true false. Okay, and if you have a question that you feel is really important and conceptual, say something that involves a, a graphical response where you'd like the students to draw something or submit text for something, like a, uh, uh, or a short answer, or even just a simply a uh, multiple select question where you want to check all the following that are true, you can't do it with this. So you have to shoehorn every question that you ask in peer instruction into some form of a multiple choice question. Okay, it seems kind of awkward. So what is the next evolutionary step in using clickers? Well, uh, how about let's eliminate uh, the added expense of owning a device and make it so that there's multiple forms of input. Okay, that would get us to something like this, or something that a lot of you have in front of you. Okay, now it's not necessarily the case that every student owns a, a portable device like this, but if a lot of them do, <laughs> most do, I think, and that's, uh, that's what we find out. So here's where I want to talk about learning catalytics, because learning catalytics is a, uh, a, a, a classroom response system that instead of using physical hardware for clickers, uses a web-based platform. So I'm going to invite you now to participate with me on this. And while I, while you uh, make sure you're logged in, I'm going to do a little bit with my displays here. Uh, if you haven't signed up already, you're just showing up. You can go to learningcatalytics.com, sign up for a student, not an instructor, but a student account with that uh, access code right there. And uh, the session number is one six seven four nine nine. This is what my students do on the first day of class. Um, or even outside of class, it's going to have to take place in a particular spot. I'm going to mess with my displays here just for a second. While you're doing that, just take that off. Okay. And let's just put this over here. There we are. And let me show you how learning catalytics works. And you will be able to follow along. Here it comes. So what you don't see, I have this set up now where um, this is set up in a dual monitor kind of situation where I have one thing on my screen and that's the other monitor, so I have something else showing on this, on this screen. It doesn't have to be done that way, uh, but this way I don't have to keep shuffling windows so you don't see the right answers to the questions as I ask them. So uh, I have a question for you, and if you're logged in, you will now see uh, a question show up on your screens. Okay? Uh, so that, uh, I have it up here on the board, of course, too, uh, but that doesn't have to take place. So if you have your login, I just served that question out to you over our Wi-Fi network. Okay? So uh, just uh, as you answer this fun little question here, here's the latest uh, 
uh, largest known crime member, fresh off the uh, presses in January from Central Missouri University. If you took that number and printed all the digits on a long single strip of paper using 10 point font, it would stretch from here to Fresh, Kirkhoff, Jemison, Muskegon, or Chicago. So select the one, this is a multiple choice question, so select the one answer you think is most correct. What I'm seeing up here, you don't see, is as you're selecting your, uh, making your selection, I'm getting a little histogram in real time as to who's selecting what. So I can see answers come in. You can see for yourself this little pie chart up there. It shows me what percentage of uh, registered students for this session have answered yet. So I can get a sense of how close we are, about two thirds of the way there. Do you see my name? Did you see it? I do not. Can you? I think I can. Um, we might put fake names in them. Yeah, <laughs> like the colonel is one of the people saying that. Find everything after all these years. He <laughs> 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 you know, may not be here, though. This is just all you have to do is be logged into this account. I mean, I had a student back when we had all the snow days a few uh, weeks ago. A student who lived in, you know, near the lake shore couldn't make it in, but, so, but she was still able to participate in this. She didn't have the benefit of the, of the setup or the debrief, but she could, all she has to do is type in a web address, and you can do that from anywhere, right? Okay, go ahead and vote in your responses. I think we're going to have an opportunity to do a true uh, peer instruction multi-round voting here in a second. I can see that there are 13 of you registered and 11 of you have sent in stuff. That might be John and I. We're both having problems with the Wi-Fi. So. Yeah, and here comes the uh, part of the issue here. So, I just turned the Wi-Fi off. All right. Is it so. last? Did you ask? Yeah. Number? We're using yeah. the web. Yeah. 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 That's right. Is there an application as well in the like the Android market or? No, this is a pure web browser pure web. type of thing. Yeah. So, uh, which which has its pros and cons, right? Uh, the fact that it's running only in a web browser means that a student can use any device that they have that has a web browser on it to, to access this. So in my 227 classes, we have smartphones going, we have iPad, full-size iPads, mini iPads, Kindle Fires, uh, and uh, Barnes & Noble readers, uh, you know, laptops, you know, a whole zoo of technology going on here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the delivery on this. And uh, I'll show you the results. Uh, the correct answer is actually the ski. It's about 27 miles long if you yes. have to strip out. <laughs> <laughs> there is the anonymity, right? <laughs> now, now in, a, in a pure peer instruction environment, I would say, like, okay, I would probably not show you the results and to say, don't have a strong consensus on this question. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and argue in favor of your answer against all the others? Okay, and then we do a repo. Okay. So that was a straight multiple choice question. Um, here's a different kind of question coming your way right now. Here we go. Uh, this is taken from a Calc 2 that I worked for his demo of this. And this is a check all that apply kind of question. Okay. So this is something you can't do with a clicker. Okay. Unless you make an extremely long question, like you have A, B, C, D, and you have A and B, A and C, A and D, B and C, B and D. You know, list all the permutations. So uh, check all that apply. Which of these is an improper integral? This is an actual question that I asked in a Calc 2 class using this uh, technology, as, as are all the remaining ones, Calc 2 and uh, 227 and 225. The fact that they're all missing DX, does that make them all improper? No. <laughs> <laughs> what are you using to yeah, LaTeX. That's nice. LaTeX. Yeah. Wow. You use a straight LaTeX. It also uses Markdown or straight text. So you can just type LaTeX directly into that. Um, in 227, this is important because I want to ask questions about matrices, and it's just straight plain LaTeX. No, no, no frills. Does this upload then in a tech file or a PDF file that somehow extracts the ideas? I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. okay. The basic answer is when you author a question, it opens up just a text window. Okay. Type it right into it. Type it in or copy it. Yeah. Or yeah, you could, what I usually do is type it into an editor, get it looking right, and dump it into the browser. Okay? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the delivery on that too. We have a strong consensus on that, and it shows us 75% uh, correct. Uh, no one's voting for the wrong one, but some people are not voting for the right ones. <laughs> Okay, so that's a that's a little bit more finely grained information uh, than you normally get from a clicker question. So I think that's kind of neat. Uh, getting more into stuff you really can't do with a clicker. 
Uh, here's a question, <coughs> uh, a standard Calc 1 question. Uh, what you have served out to your screens now is a, a picture. Okay, uh, and this is a question we always ask, a, a bread and butter Calc 1 question. You know, given a graph of a function, draw the graph as derivative, and what you can do now is just simply draw the graph of the derivative. You know, just stick your finger on your screen or take your mouse and just literally draw it. What I'm getting while you, uh, so obviously you can't do that with the <laughs> This is a, 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 a big uh, gainer over standard clicker devices. Now what I'm getting as you submit your results, I might submit anything yet, but as I get them, I have little thumbnails of what, are, uh, what you're seeing, and this is gonna generate a composite sketch for the whole class, which I can then turn around and show, and we can see the commonalities and discuss some of the differences. I'll show you that composite sketch as soon as we have a few more people. <laughs> Robert, just like, while people are drawing, can I ask a quick question? Sure. On the previous screen, after we submitted our responses and you showed us, I got on my, uh, on my device, I got a little, there's a little prompt that said, I get it now, That's or right. I still don't get it. Is That's that right. just an opportunity to give additional feedback to the instructor? That's right. That's right. Especially helpful when there's two rounds of voting going on, because uh, the student can click. If there's two rounds of voting and they still don't get it, they can click, I don't get it, I still don't get it. And that will show up for me and I can go drill down and see who said that. And then get with that student later and say, hey, I saw you still didn't understand what was going on with this question in this spot. Yeah. So I also noticed that the, the percentages were coming up, but didn't you say earlier that you don't like to show those percentages? Yeah. Yeah, let me just do yeah. I'll show you. What I can do is I can stop the voting and just immediately re deliver it. So I can say there's no consensus, but they don't see them. But I can see them. I control when the results are shown or not. But I can re deliver a question without showing the results. Okay. Okay, let me go ahead and stop that delivery and I'll just show you. Uh, Kind of what this looks like. Here's the here's the uh, final. Here's the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can see some strong consensus and one smiley face. Uh, I in okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very <worried> response. <laughs> yeah, you can see that a lot of people. This, this is multiple. I can see this is multiple, right? Not one person that's dragging a finger back and forth many times. But that's okay. That shows me some consensus. Uh, rather than in a clicker situation, I have to create several potential solutions for this as graphs and have students click which one you want. That sort of gives the game away. What you want to do is see if students can construct that graph without having a prompt. Just here's the original draw the derivative. Right? Just it's very natural that way. So this uh, takes the place of the pencil and paper. Okay. Next question here uh, is another sort of graphical question. Um, here's a graph, uh, tap or click on the point where the derivative is maximized. Okay, another sort of bread and butter calculus question. So this is a, a heat map uh, question. Okay, what's gonna happen is you just go and try to click on the correct area, and what I'm gonna be getting up here is a little map that has like the, the clicks. It shows me the dots where the clicks happen. And what I, what, to author this question, what I have to do is I have to go and draw a little box around a region that I'm gonna consider to be the right answer. Okay. And so any clip that falls within that box is going to get a green dot. Any clip that falls outside that box is going to have a red dot. On the previous one, did you have to enter what the right answer was in some way? Did you no, put that, boxes that, or something? That one actually didn't have a right answer to it. That was just gathering data. Okay. And then I turned that back around in the class. So that doesn't have a right or wrong answer. It's just a, what do you think this is? Yeah. No, as a student, can I go back and look at these as the Yeah, as a student, you can go back and look. This is all archived. Uh, every, every answer you give and every question is archived with the right answer to that. So uh, you don't have to post the quicker questions later. It's helpful for review for exams and that sort of thing. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop at the blizzard. If you'd like to click in, go ahead. Actually, let me do this. Uh, we don't have a strong consensus on this particular question. Okay, so I'm going to stop the delivery and deliver it right back to you for round two. Okay, so I want you to turn to your neighbor and discuss, argue vociferously for your answer and against all the other ones.
largest no, no, no. Like, like no, no, no. So, so that's Technology is more But here's <laughs> uh, but uh, after debate and discussion and review with each other, uh, here are the results of round two uh, of the 77 no. Okay, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so something magical sort of happens here, right? We have not a real strong consensus on the right now. I don't think anyone's be satisfied 55 percent correct on anything. Uh, but you just turn it around to the students and let them discuss it, and usually they can work themselves. Right, and uh, the the two that are kind of right here, you know, what, what's what's going on with that? It's a negative sign. Negative. Yeah, negative sign. So we can sort of have a discussion about, okay, do we mean by maximize we mean largest negative or only largest positive? Okay, so you know, for the most part, I mean that's a that's a conceptual thing that we now have picked up. Okay, we can repair if that's a, we consider that to be a misconception. Is it a misconception or just a poorly written question? Okay, so we can we can talk about that. Okay, but it's something that we can pick up and repair now rather than the exam, right? <laughs> which is sort of like the main thing. Last question I want to serve out to you is a text-based question. And uh, this is, again, something else you can't do. Just what's the question you currently have about all this? And you can just take out your devices and text it up. It's not really texting, you know, it doesn't use SMS. It's, uh, it's still over a Wi-Fi network, but it's still, um, <coughs> you're entering in uh, a verbal response of some sort. Once this is over with, I'm going to do a quick demo of how to offer these questions. And you can see some of the options you have available to you. Okay. <laughs> Most rooms have kind of a macro problem, but I don't think that's the case. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we had this discussion before the call started. Think about that. <laughs> Any questions for me while you're while we're entering the text here? But I entered it. <laughs> I mean, other than I'm gonna see, I want to see these. <laughs> okay, let me go ahead and stop. Uh, stop. Oh. I'll show you what I've got. Oh, you know, here's okay, <laughs> stop. There's a number of ways you can add the text information. One is just do a straight paragraph text, and so this creates sort of like a Google form here. We ask students to type in text in Google form and dump it. What I have going on here is it's going to create. Um, I'll show you the answer. And stop. Uh, it creates a uh, word cloud. So um, it gives me uh, a little cloud here that uh, the, the font size is proportional to frequency. So like the, the bigger words are the bigger issues. Okay, so uh, <laughs> it says all there lives the kernel. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Use this sparing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you know that can be useful for like an end of the class one minute paper type of thing where you're asking students, you know, what was the most unclear point for the day? You can skim, just look at this and see like, okay, a lot of people say second derivative or something like that. Well, second derivative is obviously in a lot of people's minds, so let's uh, plan something. I'll, I'll, I'll change my teaching plan accordingly. Or you could do this in the middle of the class or in the front end. Okay, um, let me talk a little bit about... Um, you might have some questions now about how to author some of these questions and what goes under the hood. So let me uh, get back to uh, single display mode here. I might pull this up. <laughs> this is kind of 
dashboard that I see. So if I wanted to uh, create a new question, well, let's say that in my department seminar, if I want to create a new module, the, this group of questions that I've given to you is called a module. Say I want to create one, just click the module, and let's say like a demo of a module date, sure. Um, I can have what I, you just do is synchronous, which means that we're all answering at the same time. You can also self, set this up to be self-paced or self-paced and graded, which is the self-test thing. I've experimented with this in 227 with having students do quizzes outside of class. I have a few things to say about that. As a, it didn't work so well. I'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. And this, this uh, team-based assessment is really interesting. Uh, you set up a module so students will come in and answer a bank of questions individually first and then go into a team and answer them as a team second. And uh, there's some rules for doing this. Um, Let's stick to something simple, synchronous, and I've got this. Um, I can change change this up. I can change how the credit is assigned. If I want to create a new question, there's two ways to do that. Uh, I can do it manually. And uh, well, this is what you're asking about. This is what you see when you offer a question. Up here are all the question types. I can enter in text and have students highlight uh, the text that's up on the screen. Like, what's the what's wrong with the following definition, for example? They have to highlight the incorrect uh, definition. This one was just added yesterday, interestingly enough, image upload. I haven't had a chance to play with this, but students are asked a question, and the answer is you take a picture with your phone and submit it. Uh -huh. It shows all the pictures, right? Uh -huh. So, uh, what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> 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 multiple choice numerical where you answer you can enter in numbers and you can give it a tolerance level around the number that you like. Um, <coughs> any kinds of questions region, which is what you guys played with a while ago. Uh, sketching, word cloud, short answer, or you can just create a slide of information just to set things up. So I think there are 17 types of questions at this point. Yeah, composite sketch, confidence level, uh, collecting data. And one that's very helpful in uh, Calc 3 is directionally you can draw a vector and uh, it specifies what the right, you have to get the magnitude and the direction right, and plot a vector in R2. Uh, you can even enter in uh, LaTeX expressions, it'll parse the LaTeX and tell you if you have the right, or what's the derivative of cosine of 3x, and you type in the, the LaTeX and it'll parse that out and tell whether it's right or not, interestingly enough. <coughs> um, you enter in the prompt, you have an option, you enter in your answer options here, you have an option to share, and I'll mention that in a minute, you can tag your results. Why should we share and tag the results? Uh, because uh, another way to enter in a question is there's a library of questions available through Learning Catalytics. Um, that um, It's kind of small now because this is a soft piece of software that's just getting ramped up, but every time, for example, I offer a question and tag it and ask it to be shared, it gets dumped into a common library. So if I wanted to say, let me go get a question. Yeah, you don't have to actually offer the questions in other words. You can just go through and sort through what other people have done to pick one. Um, so for example, I'll eliminate my name from this, and let's see something uh, like physics. Uh, no word cloud, just anything. So here are a bunch of physics questions that are uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be absolutely good. I mean, let's see. Really like I said, like how okay. Here's some of mine. Yeah. yeah, draw a picture of the best describes your attitude. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's, some, here's some things that have just been offered by people using the system. So it's pretty nice that you can search through, like I really need a question that's a word cloud question about solids revolution or something like that. And can, there may not be anything, but at least you can search for it. Yeah. When you created this uh, graph question, mm -hmm. so uh, do you create the graph on the system or do you have to create the graph elsewhere? I create that it? elsewhere, but you upload it as a simple JPEG or a okay. ping. <coughs> I just created that in a separate, yeah, Maple or MapEver or whatever, and export it as a ping or a PDF and upload it. Yeah. How long per question do you roughly take to, to offer a question? Offer? Is it lengthy? Boy, I don't know. It's 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 really hard to make a good multiple choice question. I'll, I'll right. say that. It's, you have to be very mindful that the, the the foils in the question are not totally obviously wrong. Uh, that you have enough of them and so forth. Right. I, I find that it doesn't take me very long at all. Uh, except in a few cases where I really got to get this one thing right. Because you only have time in the peer instruction class to ask maybe three or four of these. So I've got to really nail it. So you have to think very carefully. This is what the majority of my prep looks like. I have to think really carefully about what students normally get wrong about things mm -hmm. and write a question about Fall that. Down it's right, right at the seams. So uh, let students wrestle with it in class. Right? So uh, I don't find that I take any more prep time than I used to when I was just doing lecture. Okay. This is very, very different stuff. Yeah. 
there's also a pro there are several problem banks that you have pointed me to at one point. Yeah, um, uh, there are, the the Hughes Hallett textbook I think now actually has a has a peer instruction uh, problem bank to it. Believe it or not, that's specifically made for peer instruction. So they're they're really on board with this. And of course, physics is loaded with this because this is really arising out of physics ed research. Okay. So um, that is a quick tour of learning catalytics. Any further questions on that? Um, all right, so it, this sounds like such an amazing thing. What are the drawbacks? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to get to the drawbacks, I think you have to put it in context. That's where I'm going to kind of go next with this, right? So uh, let's, let me talk again about implementing this uh, Bring Your Own Device uh, approach So I first tried this out in uh, Math 202 last spring. Uh, there, instructors can get a 30-day free license to try this out. And of course, in the spring course, that's perfect. It fits right on top of the spring semester. It's four weeks long. And the students loved it. Uh, we had clickers, regular clickers for a while. Then I learned about learning catalogs and we switched. The 30-day license ran out before the semester ran out, so we switched back to clickers, and students were mad. I mean, they were mad that we were not using learning catalogs anymore. Like, oh, these clickers are terrible. Yeah, so uh, that, was, that was pretty successful. Uh, and some of those questions you saw were uh, from that course. And so in the fall, I wrote this uh, grant to the to, uh, the FTLC for a Pew Technology, Technology Enhancement Grant. That got us uh, 60 licenses for students. Students purchase a license for the software. It's $12 a semester or uh, $20 for the year, I think, and it's unlimited classes. So uh, if you have like a, you're taking a four course load and everybody's using the system, you pay once. Uh, you have no you know, technology left over to do nothing with later on. And we also, being sensitive to the fact that not every student owns one of these devices, we also use the money to buy nine of these. Okay, these are Nexus 7 uh, tablet devices uh, from Google. Uh, they're the cheapest thing that I could find that has a web browser on it that really works. Okay, and so uh, we bought nine of those. It was supposed to be ten, uh, but I'll get to that and we'll watch. <laughs> Ask Lori too. Yeah. Uh, the student licenses, are they only for the semester then? Uh, you can buy them for the whole year too. Okay. Yeah. But then they expire after the year is up. Yeah. And uh, so right now, uh, in my two sections of 227, that's what we're using. We're using uh, peer instruction, or courses organized around peer instruction using uh, learning catalogs. So what I want to do now is just kind of walk you through some Maybe not all of these, but some of the more interesting results that I that have come up here. This is totally anonymized data, but it's real data from both of these sections. I just want to ask, invite you to put yourselves in the shoes of the instructor. And like, when you see this data, what do you do with it? Okay, keeping also in mind that at least we have the data that we can do something with. Okay, this is pretty important. So this is a uh, this is a uh, question back from January about uh, subsets being spanned by a set of vectors. So the question was, look at these three vectors in R four. Do these vectors span all of R four? And the options there, in case you can't see, are yes and I'm sure, yes but I'm not sure, no but I'm not sure, and no and I'm sure. So it's a yes no with a confidence interval wrapped around it. Okay, and this is a section uh, one, uh, two. In the first round of voting, we had about 57 percent of the students voting the right answer. Uh, in the second round, uh, 82, not only were more students answering correctly, they were answering more confidently, too, which I think is a pretty nice effect there. And again, in the second round of voting, uh, there's no instructor intervention whatsoever. I just stand in the middle of the class and say, if you have clarifying questions you need to ask, ask them. Okay, otherwise, it's all down. Okay. So that, that really, I think, illustrates the peer instruction effect, both on the correctness of the answer and on the confidence that students have. You can see the, have the 10 get it now, it's kind of a nice little plus there. Um, Robert? Yes? How long would you allow, have them spend on that type of question? One minute for the first round of voting, two minutes for the second round of voting. Right, so if you add in like a five minute mini lecture plus about five minutes for the whole deal, maybe two minutes of debriefing, then you can get about three or four of these in. And then must assume that the students have read. So that's right, that's right. So there's a little bit of flipping that goes on in my class. So they have to be reading it some more web work outside of class. Yeah. Um, here's a, another one here uh, for section two. So they have a system that's given a verb reduced echelon form, and the question is, what can you conclude about the system based on the following? Um, and so we have this is a select. Uh, this, is, this is a multiple choice one. This is just a question about you know how many solutions does the system have? And you can see that students are really understanding this concept. I don't need to explain this anymore. Okay, I might have some beautiful pristine lecture set up to explain this some more, but I can just sort of set it aside and move on to something else, really. I mean, there's very few students who are not getting this at this point. Um, now, there's a follow-on question for this. I use the same system, 
and the question was which of the following best describes the solution set? And the options here are the solution is a single point, the solution is the line y equals x, the solution is the line y equals negative x, the solution is a plane, or none of the above. Uh, it's the same system, but uh, not a lot of I mean, I guess about two-thirds of the students are getting it right, but my question to you is, you look at these data, you're up here, the students are out there, it's real time, you see the data come in, what do you do? <laughs> right, you now have the opportunity to do something. What, what is the basic misconception? What do you see here? 64% of the students are voting for the correct answer that the, uh, solution, is the, uh, the solution set is the line y equals x. Okay. It doesn't label the percentages on here because they're too small, but 21% are voting for the line y equals negative x. So what exactly is the misconception here? Yeah, well, Where the equal sign goes, right? They, they, <laughs> they want to put the first yeah. column equals the second and put a, you know, an x in one and a y in the other. Okay, so this isn't really a problem about linear algebra anymore, no. really. I mean, the, they, they understand that the solution set is a line. That's a, that's a big idea, okay? So I can conclude fairly certainly that about 85% of the students almost the same number they got the first one right, not coincidentally, uh, are really basically getting this correct. Okay, the only thing is, how do you interpret the outcome of this, this system? Okay, that's what I gotta focus on next. Okay, I might have had some idea like, oh man, you guys still don't understand why this is a line. They, they must have understand this is a line, this is which line is it? How do you interpret the equation form of the system that's come up? So it's a very different sort of decision tree that takes place when you have the data in front of you. Um, this one is maybe one of my favorites here. So this is one from quite recently, just a few weeks ago. Uh, to just, so I'm going to show you comparative data between two, same question, same preparation, uh, or at least same assigned preparation. <laughs> Level preparation, don't know about that, between the two sections I'm teaching. So um, they had a web work quiz to do prior to class that uh, gave them, one of the questions on it was a two by two matrix A and asked them to compute A cubed. Okay, it was like one, zero, two, four, or something like that. And a lot of students were coming back saying like, I typed in one, zero, eight, 64, and it's not right. What happened? <laughs> like, yeah, what happened? <laughs> so I, I decided to ask this question is to see if they've gotten it between the night before and the day of. I didn't really have, didn't plan on asking this, but I thought, well, let's just throw this out there. So if A is a square matrix and the compute A to the fourth, raise each of the entries of the fourth power. True or false? Okay, uh, here's the uh, first section, <laughs> with, uh, and here's the second section. Big difference. Now this is the same group, but not the same group as good. Essentially, the same size class, different times of the day, I guess, but why should that matter, right? 91% uh, is getting, of one section getting right, but only 83 of the other. What's going on with section one? <laughs> That's my question. Um, Here's what I discovered about section one. They were the ones who were taking the initiative to get started on the web work early. And because they started on the web work early, they were getting it wrong early. <laughs> and so they were they never took the time to get it right. I think the section two people you know, had a little bit more time to think about you know, why, they, why this was uh, not coming out right. Because I think they were jumping on that web work question so quickly, uh, they were getting it wrong in greater numbers. So it's interesting that their personal initiative is sort of working against them. I, I threw that out to the students. They think that's my, maybe why this is. I, said, yeah, I think so, interestingly enough. Um, this one is really good, too. So uh, standard stock linear algebra question on matrix operations. And we, this is actually following uh, some lecture that took place on this. Like, you know, I stand up there and I look people right in the eye and say, matrix multiplication is not commutative. Okay, wave my arms and everything. Then I ask this question. Uh, and so here's the first section. Good students, right? Good listeners. Uh, here's the second section. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what's going on there? Well, <laughs> you can't treat the same classes the same way. I mean, you just can't do it. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, I don't need to say another word about commutativity and matrix multiplication in this group of 30 students. About a quarter of these students, you know, I need to know what's going on here. And what, had, what it turned out is a lot of them didn't do reading. And this, this has been an ongoing issue with that particular section about low completion of the reading questions, and that's where it came from. Okay, so you get down, you drill down, you can find some things out. Um, let's see, do I want this one? Yeah, let's try this one. So here's another question in the same bunch here, um, <coughs> and this is a select all the following and apply question. So if you have a matrix that's invertible and B is the inverse of A, then which of the following is true? Okay, and I'm pointing to that third foil there because I'm trying to see if they moved on from the A to the fourth question. Right? 
right? Because when you think like, oh, A inverse, that means you just flip everything over, right? That's got to be how it works. And so you should answer C and D both mm -hmm. correct at the same time, you think, but I don't know, it's a disconnect. Anyway, here's the uh, first question. So that's that's good. You know, everybody's voting for the right stuff and hardly anybody's voting for the wrong stuff. Here's the second one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So uh, again, and uh, so that, that's interesting because that section two got, uh, this was a section that got almost all of the A to the fourth question right, but not this one. <laughs> so what do we have to do here? Got yeah. So on the left where it says the one gets the nap, is that one one of the C or D selections? No, it's one of these. Uh, actually, I don't know. I think that, I think that's not tied to your right answer or wrong answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering why you put it for that. And that I'm not sure. Questions. I'm not sure. It just showed up. Okay. Uh, so what I had to do with this section here was just like, okay, uh, so those of you who are saying, who are not voting for that question, why? Why, why, why is it not the case that the entries of B are the receptacles of the entries of A? And so somebody just says, well, look at this two by two matrix. And there was a real easy debrief on that one. I just let the students handle it. So those of you who are, you know, say, those of you who are, you know, the 84% of you who are not voting for that incorrect, that incorrect answer, which at this point they can see is incorrect, we got to understand why. Okay, so tell me why. What's what do you, what do you got? And so that's what they gave me, and then everybody seemed to be okay with that. Finally, here's a, a question that was really fun. Every non-zero matrix has an inverse, right? Because non-zero numbers have inverses, so non-zero matrices should have inverses too. This is going to show the, the interesting effect of uh, the, the round two voting. So this was kind of disconcerting on round one, <laughs> first of all, uh, that in my, my section that normally gets a lot of stuff right, only about two thirds of the students were voting correctly on this. But after round two, everybody got it right. And I said nothing okay, about rightness or wrongness or inverses or anything. I just sort of said, okay, talk to each other. And round two, everybody got it right. Uh, and round, in section two, it was 50-50, and only 75-25 roughly on the second round. Okay, in terms of normalized gain, normalized gain is defined as the ratio uh, between the, uh, the the actual differences between pre and post test and the ideal difference between pre and post test. Like every, this is a percentage. Everybody who could have changed the right answer did, and only 42% of the people who could have changed the right answer in that section did. <laughs> okay, so. This calls for a little bit of agile teaching, right? You have to sort of think on your toes. You can't just come in with a set thing to teach about. You have to say, okay, well, these guys, this is the data I'm getting from them. Well, at least we can move on with this section. This one, stop, okay? And let's probe, let's see what's going on here. Okay. Uh, you can begin to see some patterns for this section too begin to sort of emerge as well. They're not bad students, but they, they have a lot of more misconceptions kind of along the same lines in section one does. Okay, so this is good data. Uh, let me just kind of end here by talking about three things. What's been good, what's been sort of challenging, what I'm going to be doing next for the remainder of the semester. First of all, students are really engaged. Uh, we don't see very much uh, the, the, the Facebook effect. You know, I do am very sensitive to the fact that I have a room full of 30 you know, students with mobile phones up in front of them all the time during class. And I told them at the beginning of the class, I, I consider that to be on me to be more interesting than Facebook. Okay, let's uh, take that as a challenge. Uh, but uh, very few uh, instances of people, I had an FTLC person come observe the class and she saw maybe one person like would vote in and then quickly do a Facebook check and then come back. But that person wasn't really disengaged, they were just sort of passing the time because they knew the answer and they just wanted to kind of do a quick check. It's not a big deal. Um, it's, it's great to be able to catch and fix these misconceptions almost as they are happening. Okay, so I don't have to wait until there's a crash on the exam to go back and say, whoa, what happened? I can, I can get that before they leave. Uh, it, it allows me to focus on conceptual understanding class. And in 227, that is the key. I mean, the calculations in, in linear algebra are dead simple, but they are so hard to figure out which one you're supposed to do next. Uh, that's, that's the hard part of linear algebra, really, just about any class. And I really haven't had any problems with students resisting this method of teaching versus just doing lots and lots of examples. I mean, the further on we go into the semester, students want more and more examples. I say, these are examples. <laughs> what, what, what are these? These are examples. So, okay, there we go. Um, and, and, and I've mentioned agile teaching, which is a, a, a way I particularly feel very comfortable in using uh, to be able to fix misconceptions as they happen. What's been challenging here? The tech problems, okay, Wi-Fi droppage. Uh, you know, Mackinac has just got the strangest Wi-Fi configuration I've seen. You can be in like sitting where Ted is and it's fine. You can be sitting where Gary is and it's not fine. I, I have no answer for that. And that's been a problem. Well, one time the learning catalytic server crashed mid-session. 
and we were, we were done. And we had a, I had to go to the I had to go to the write the letter on a piece of paper method and hold up in the air. Right? We had to do sort of work after like that. Uh, so right, no, nothing that isn't fixable, but you know this is just ongoing issues. Um, some of these learning capabilities features are hard to implement well, like the team-based assessment didn't go well. I'd like to give it another shot, I think it's cool, but it didn't work well the one time I tried it. So I, I just don't think I knew what I was doing. You know. uh, obviously, selling students on the central importance of conceptual understanding, a lot of students will come into math classes thinking like it's all about calculating stuff, and it's not, and you have to convince them that that's hard. Um, the students didn't do well on their exam on the conceptual questions, I'll just say that. Uh, and I'm not really sure why, because they had very similar clicker type questions given as multiple choice items. Wasn't so great. Uh, finally, dealing with Google has been a massive pain in the rear end. Uh, they're, they're, they do not know how to work with higher education institutions. And Google, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, the, the, we, the reason we don't have 10 Nexus tablets is because they still haven't refunded us the tax for being a tax exempt institution. So we had to card out 300 bucks to pay for the taxes on these things. And it's been four months, they still haven't given it back to us. So talk to Lori, she'll, she'll give me a careful about that. Uh, what's next? Uh, I'm mixing in some more, some much more deliberate and verbiage classroom approaches where, where there's very little lecturing going on at all. Uh, learning Catalytics is taking more of the role of a conversation starter. So if students have a ton of questions coming into the class, we'll just do those. But if they don't, I have Learning Catalytics questions rounded up and ready to go. Uh, we're starting to unit on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is a prime target for visual uh, questions. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of those. Uh, we're going to try the team-based assessment one more time, and we're trying to see where learning catalytics fits into the grand scope of GBSU. GBSU is thinking about moving in this bring your own device direction, but it's, they're thinking of a piece of software called Top Hat Monocle, which uh, you've you know, I think you've heard of them before, possibly. They, they sent some emails around. And so right now we're kind of thinking that IT is leaning one direction, I'm leaning another direction. We're trying to figure out which system to go to. But basically, everyone in, in uh, ed tech seems to be agreeing that these things are at the end of life at this point. These are not going to be around for much longer. I mean, that's for the best. OK, so thanks for this. And I know I don't have a lot of, actually, kind of overtime a little bit. But uh, if you have any quickie questions, I'm happy to take them now. Charlie. Socrative, do you know about Socrative? I do know about Socrative. Socrative, I, de I auditioned that when I was thinking about using this in 202. Didn't care for it. It's very slow, uh, very buggy. Uh, I didn't like the way it felt. Uh, the big yeah. thing about it is it's free. It is free, and it works on text message mode, too, if I recall correctly, which is kind of a nice thing for when the Wi-Fi drops out. But um, just didn't care for that. Didn't have a lot of question choices. So it's, a, it's an OK problem, but I felt the learning catalogs is better. Yeah. yeah. Is Top Hat Monocle friendly with LaTeX? Uh, they say it is, but I never tried it. Okay. So I asked them that specifically. They said, yeah, you can just do LaTeX normally, but I've never seen okay. exactly how it works. This is sort of horrible equation editor that you have to deal with. Or I like running catalogs because it's just a text editor. Mm -hmm. It's nice yeah. and clean. Nice. Yeah, no. Oh, yes, of course. What was the cost to you to use this? Zero. Instructor accounts are free. OK. Yeah. That's kind of my question. How do students react to 12 bucks? I asked, uh, well, th these students aren't paying anything. All the credit under the grant. Uh, I remember asking the 202 students about this, and uh, they said, yeah, bring it on. We'll pay it. It's worth it. They'd be willing to roll it into a horse fee, for example. Yeah. Especially if there was some great free calculus textbook that they'd be given. All right, thank you again for your attention.